Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have with us a distinguished faculty, Dr. Josh Lebert. He is one of the pioneers of the field of protein microarrays, especially NAPA technology, nucleic acid, programmable protein arrays. Dr. Lebert also is the key leader of biomarker discovery programs and he also leads uh, one of the program operated by the Early Detection Research Network or EDRN in US for the biomarker discoveries. So, he brings lot of uh, his expertise his experience of both technology development as well as how it can be applicable for the uh, clinical problems and especially biomarker discoveries. Imagine that you know we are working uh, let us say right now in Indian context I am in Mumbai based and we have the samples coming from Maharashtra from you know uh, different hospitals from Tata Memorial and KEM and Hinduja various local hospitals here. Now our population is very restricted we are talking about people only coming to these hospitals and trying to look at uh, in a given context of a given disease what kind of proteins are being changed. And let us imagine that you know that particular protein a given protein looks pretty interesting which looks very uniform in a given disease context in this population base. But if you think about can we claim that protein as a biomarker I think that it may not be the, the right claim right. So, how to claim that you have a good biomarker of course, the biomarker should be generic it should be global and it should really work in you know variety of clinical settings. So, validation is really really required that is the key for making the success of any potential candidates to the right you know biomarker for the clinical and therapeutic interventions. Today Dr. Josh Reber is going to talk to you about some of the details about biomarker and validation strategies. Okay, so the first thing that most of us as scientists would do when we do a biomarker is we would observe a difference. So, you remember those two graphs I showed you? That is the first step. You, you take a bunch of samples, you know, cancer samples and healthy samples or early stage and late stage or whatever your comparison is, you measure something and you see that the value of that x is much bigger here than here and there is a difference. You say, wow, okay. And the first thing you have to do is say I do not have a biomarker yet because you do not have a biomarker yet, but you do have an observed difference and the type of statistics you might do are simple statistics. You might do a t-test, you might do a Wilcoxon rank test, something simple to confirm that those two values are different, but that is not a marker yet. So, now how do you go about getting a marker? So, the next step is you need to say ok, I think I have a biomarker, now I need to do a larger scale comparison. I have to look at more people, right? And so we would call that a candidate biomarker and we'll do a comparison between properly matched cases and controls. So how do you match the controls to the cases though? Age, right? Gender, right? You're right. Those are the two big ones I would say. Um, uh, maybe as you, as you pointed out the population, right? So you're not going to um, take a bunch of people with HIV in Africa and compare them to a bunch of Americans who have no HIV. That would not be a fair comparison to two very different populations. So, you're, you're, you need to you know try to stay within the same communities, same age group, same gender group. Ideally, the best matching of cases and controls would be the same group of people that go to the same hospital except that this group has the disease and this group does not. So, that is they are coming from the same population. Uh, and then that's that's what we call a matched population. Sometimes, like in their specialties, like in the case of a cancer, a lung cancer study, you would want to make sure that the cases and the controls had similar smoking histories, right? Because you don't want to be finding a marker that predicts smoking. You want to find a marker that predicts cancer. So you have to consider your cases and controls carefully. You match them, and then the first thing you do is how, determine how many cases and controls you need to study and how do you do that? 
How do you figure out how many to study? Power analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you need to you need to get a statistician to help you do what's called a power analysis. And a power analysis is a statistical mathematical study that takes into account how big a difference in the value you expect to see, how prevalent the, the disease is in the population, um, you know, uh, uh, how uh, narrow the variation is in the measurement that you're making. Does it vary a lot? Does it vary a little? It takes a lot of these things into account. They do some mathematics and they'll say, you know what, for the difference you're trying to achieve, you need to do this many people, in cases and controls. Typically when they say the difference you want to achieve, the, the way they will phrase it is, if you want to detect a difference in, uh, with 80 percent certainty, this is how many you have to study. And so you have to, you have to say at what level you're willing to say I might miss it. So you'll say I'll, I'm willing to uh, do this, I'll, I'll do this study if I can get it 85 percent of the time. So that's what a power analysis is. If you see a study where people are doing biomarkers and they didn't do a power analysis, they didn't do it right. And I can tell you that 85 percent, 90 percent of what comes to my desk as an editor, they never did a power analysis. Right? And so that's a real problem. All right, then you're going to then you're going to eventually measure sensitivity and specificity and we're going to come back to that. We're also going to talk a little bit about the rece receiver operating characteristic curve analysis and false discovery rate compensation. But all of these types of mathematics will come into play when you do this first candidate biomarker study. Okay, so you did your study and you got it looks promising. So you, you get a marker and it has let's just say 85 percent sensitivity at at 95 percent specificity. So are you done? Can you publish? Nah. What do you have to do next? So you did a study. You, you, did, you did the power analysis. You compared the populations. You found a biomarker. It has 85 percent sensitivity. What do you have to do? Well, you certainly can look for other people who have done the same work, um, but the, the simple answer is you have to repeat the study because you're going to get markers, right? Typically, m many of us are going to be studying thousands of variables. If I, on my array, right, on the NAPA arrays, we have now maybe 15,000 proteins, right? So let's say the chance of, let's say that the, the if you, the p-value that people often say is 0.05, right? 5 percent. So the chance of finding that value by chance alone is 5 percent. That's what it means when you set a probability, a p-value of 0.05. So take 5 percent of 15,000. How often am I going to find a biomarker by chance alone? Quite a bit, right? Just by chance alone, when you study a lot of variables, you're going to get, you're going to get a marker that works, all right? So um, the first thing you have to do when you get markers that look promising is test them again on another population. And that's what's here. So you repeat the study, you verify the marker and it's important in this case to use a completely different set of patients and controls. And that's important why? Why is it important when you do the second study to use different people? Prevent redundancy, okay, maybe expand that a little bit. So you've already shown that that marker works for that population. For whatever reason, that marker, let's assume you did their study carefully, separates cases and controls. <coughs> the question you're asking in this study is, is that a general fact or is that just happen to be a random chance for that one population? So by doing it in a different population, you are verifying that in fact um, it really is for the disease and not just by chance alone. So there's a famous story in proteomics, some of you may remember this, but at the beginning of this century there was a, po there was a paper published in the Lancet, it was a proteomics paper and they developed a blood test for ovarian cancer. And it was based on mass spectrometry. 
and they, they claimed that they had 100% sensitivity and 99% specificity. Astonishing numbers. Anybody who knows anything about biomarkers looked at that and said, bullshit, <laughs> that's not right. There's no way that you could get 100% sensitivity. Biology is not that predictive. Well, so they got a lot of press. Whole programs were started at the NIH around it. A huge amount of excitement. It was a big deal that proteomics had solved the detection of ovarian cancer. And it all failed. It was a huge, miserable failure. And it set back proteomics by a decade because people stopped funding us because they said that we make claims that we can't support. And one of the fundamental mistakes that they made in that study was in their validation step, they used the same control group. They did use different cases, but they used the same controls. And so they didn't follow the rule that this group has to be different from that group. And consequently, for whatever reason, that control group had a defined pattern that was definable as control, and that's what allowed their biomarker to work, but it was just random chance. It had nothing to do with ovarian cancer. And so that was a huge error. So you have to be careful about that. So that, if you get to this point, and your marker still holds up, <coughs> now I think you're ready to publish. At this point, you can say, I've got a verified biomarker. This is worth telling the world about, and, and then you can send it, out for, send it out for review. I will tell you, as an editor for JPR, if I don't see this, I don't even review it. I send it right back to the author. If they don't do a validation study, they're out. I just I won't even look at it. All right. So then, I'm sorry. It, it could be as long as they're different people. Different people. They could be from the same hospital. They have to be different controls, and they have to be different cases. All, there can be no overlap in the people. No, same disease, but. Different people. <coughs> yeah. So, for example, if let's say you you have a you have 200 people with ovarian cancer at your hospital, and you found 200 women with you know that are good controls, you could split them into 100 cases and 100 controls and do your first study, <coughs> and take the second hundred and the second hundred and do your verification study. That'd be perfectly good design. Okay. So after you get your verification, you still have a long way to go to get a validated marker. Now you have to do what's called a validated biomarker study. <coughs> These sorts of studies are typically a level past most academic labs. Most of us can't do these studies. They have to be done very formally. These studies should be done under what's called either CLIA or Good Laboratory Practices Certification. They should be large studies. They should be blinded studies. Blinded means that the, the scientists who are measuring the values do not know who has the disease and who doesn't, right? And, and uh, all of that is hidden in the documents. They have to make their predictions based on what they set back here. Uh, typically, there should be a prospective study. What do I mean by prospective study? Right, so what does that mean? That's right. So you're not looking at samples that you collected last year. You're collecting samples in the same manner that you would be doing it if you were treating patients. You collect the sample and you test it and you see whether it predicted properly or not. Um, and then um, you, you need to do these in more than one location. If you get this done, what that tells you is your marker is truly predictive. It really does predict the disease. That's great. That is already something to be very proud of. Now you have a marker that predicts disease. Are you done? You can tell you're not done because there's still space left on the slide. <laughs> right? Right, so there's still more to do, right? So just because the marker tells you that the patient that can predict the disease, you still don't know if it will be of clinical benefit using that marker. And so the next step you have to do is what's called a utility study. You have to ask, if I use this marker on a population, will it tell me something that reduces mortality or morbidity in that population because I detected the disease early. Okay, and so here what you do is the same thing as here, <coughs> randomized blinded study, prospective study, but in this case you're doing it as an intended use. You're measuring, you're measuring it, 
you're predicting an outcome, you're telling the patient and you're acting on the prediction and you ask the question, in those people with whom I use the marker, did they have a better outcome than the people who did not use the marker? Did the marker save lives? Did the marker reduce disease? And this is where a lot of markers fail. So some of you may be familiar with this marker called CA125, <clears throat> which is a very good marker for ovarian cancer. Um, there is no doubt that CA125 levels correlate with ovarian cancer. <clears throat> that marker is used all the time as a disease progression marker to monitor ovarian cancer. It's quite specific. The problem is if you do CA125 uh, to detect cancer, um, it, you don't see any better outcomes. And the, the problem appears to be that by the time the CA125 levels are measurable, the cancer, it's already too late. They, it doesn't come up early enough. And so it's, it's a predictive marker, so it fits, it succeeds here and it fails here. If this works here, then you get an approved marker. And now you're in good shape. I can tell you that this whole process is, is very long, very expensive, and has only been successfully done a handful of times. Okay, so, um, so what are the skill sets that you need to accomplish all these tasks, right? And so that's what's shown here. Uh, <clears throat> and this is just to emphasize that to get a good marker, you need a multidisciplinary team. There's no way around that. So you need to have, early on, you need to do these first sort of studies, you need people with molecular and cellular biology experience. Throughout the study, but especially at the beginning, you'll need genomics and informatics. As you go further into the study, you need good statistics. You need um, to develop strong, robust markers that you can, that do in the clinic. You need good analytical chemistry. Obviously, you need good clinical understanding and understanding of epidemiology. And then when to, when to use these markers depends on looking at health policy. So at different stages of the game, you're going to need different uh, experts. But throughout the whole process, you're going to need a lot of experts. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the, how you do it varies a little bit. Uh, it depend, the way you do the power analysis depends on the study and what goes into it. So for example, oftentimes when you're at this phase, you might be doing d protein arrays or, you know, uh, next-gen sequencing or some kind of large-scale, omics scale study where the number of variables is very large. And the type of power analysis you have to do with large variable numbers is different than if you're testing, doing a power analysis for just one marker that you have as a predictor. Um, in this case, you may have to do modeling statistics to get a good predictor. You might have a simple formula you could use over here. But the idea is the same. It's just the execution is different. OK, so where, the, where, where does this go wrong? So this can go wrong in a lot of places, and it does all the time. So um, uh, the first mistake is you, you, you discover some kind of a difference, but without defining a clinical need. If you haven't defined the clinical need, <clears throat> your difference may be meaningless or may be useless. Um, people often do inappropriate statistics on these candidate biomarkers. They'll look for p-values instead of um, uh, uh, doing proper biomarker statistics. Uh, people don't do, an, they, they do what's called an underpowered study. What's an underpowered study? The what? The sample size is too small. Yeah, exactly. The sample size is too small. And there's two consequences to that. The, f the first consequence to that, the most common and historical consequence is that if, you, if your sample size is too small, then you, you run the risk of missing a good marker because you didn't study enough people. You, didn't, you, 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 you won't have as enough of a chance to find the marker. In the modern era, the problem is a little bit different. The, the modern era, the problem is these days we don't study a few variables. We study tens of thousands of variables. And so in the modern era, an underpowered study usually means that you're going to find differences that are meaningless. You're going to find random chances that this gene is different from that from in the cases and controls and it's not related to the cancer at all because um, of what's called overfitting. Overfitting is statistically finding something that isn't really real 
and it's a huge problem in our field. I can pretty much guarantee you, if you see a paper published, and typically they're published in the best journals, Science, Cell, Nature, you'll see a paper published next week, a month from now, on a marker that has 100% sensitivity and 99% specificity. And if you look carefully, they probably overfit. Because no markers are ever that good. Okay, so um, failure to account for overfitting. I just said it. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, using inappropriate samples, poorly selected controls. So people don't carefully match the controls. So for example, I've seen studies <coughs> where people um, used a bunch of cases from one location and then they ordered their controls from a company. And then they compared the two and said, I found a marker. I can tell the difference. Well, they can tell the difference between samples that came from the company and samples that came from this hospital. They didn't necessarily find the disease. <coughs> In fact, if you know Paul Tempst, he's a proteomics researcher at Sloan Kettering. Paul did a study where he was looking at prostate cancer. He was trying to replicate the kind of approach in that ovarian cancer study I mentioned earlier that totally failed. But he was trying to do it right. And what he found was, he was looking at prostate cancer, and he found a marker that was remarkably good at predicting prostate cancer. But, you know, credits to, to Paul Temps because he, he looked a little harder. And what he realized was that the prostate cancer samples were all drawn in blood samples from men who were about to get biopsies. They were all in the hospital and they were going to get biopsies. And the samples that came from the controls all came from the outpatient clinic. And it turned out that the two, two locations used a different manufacturer of the blood tubes. So the blood tube type was a little bit different. And when he did all the analysis, what it turned out was he had found a really good biomarker for blood tube type. It had nothing to do with the disease at all. It had to do with the types of the tubes that it came with. <coughs> so you have to be very careful. Um, and, so, and then uh, people often fail to develop a good, robust, reproducible assay. If you're going to do the kind of late stage validation here, you need to have a good assay for that. <coughs> Some, many people forget to do this study here, or they don't do this study here. And so that, that's, um, that sort of summarizes some of the major problems that, that you can encounter. Okay, so um, lots of challenges. Finding a good clinically useful biomarker is very rare. These days in the US, on average, maybe one to two biomarkers a year will succeed in making it through the FDA. So this is very, very challenging. And that's combining all the work of academia and industry. So all combined, that's all we get. Um, I would argue that the, biggest, cha the big, biggest challenges are the biology itself. It's very hard to find a molecule that specifically can predict the outcome of a patient. So you have to look extremely hard to find it. Um, uh, but journals don't publish negative results, and so oftentimes uh, uh, people don't realize uh, when, when markers are bad, and so they end up uh, you know, only publishing bad biomarkers. Um, no one likes to do validation. In fact, in, in, in NIH in the US, it's very hard to get funded to do a validation study. So let's say you do a good biomarker, you have all the best intentions, you do the, observ you do the observed difference, you do the uh, uh, initial study, and then you do the verification study, and you say, okay, now I want to validate this marker. The response you'll get on your grant application almost always is, well, you've already studied this marker. Why do you want to study it again? <clears throat> and you're saying, because I want to validate it. And they're like, no, no, you already studied it. You're done. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not done. So that's exactly one of the problems that we face all the time. All right, so let me move on then. So um, nonetheless, the public really expects to see these results. And that's partly because um, there's thousands of papers that report good bar biomarkers. Um, and there's usually only one good one per year. And so everybody thinks that it's easy, but in fact, it's really hard. So that's kind of a take home message.
All right, so just to conclude, uh, Dr. Josh Rebert has talked to you about uh, different basic consideration, how you can be confident that a lead which you have identified as a you know potential protein candidate, whether you can term them as a biomarker. What type of test you should do both from the statistics point of view as well as the right clinical assays in the clinics, in the labs, which can ensure that the candidate which you are uh, identified that is actually a potential biomarker. So, these basics are very important for you even if you are a student or you are a researcher who are planning to be involved in the biomarker based programs. I think you know your strategies thinking about the power calculation, the statistics, looking at the sensitivity and the specificity of the biomarkers as well as your plan to do validation of the candidates becomes very crucial. I hope these basics are really giving you new insights about how to now utilize this understanding, this knowledge for the actual clinical applications. Thank you very much.